Rise and shine. Actually, th this is th the verse we're beginning with. Arise, shine, for your light has come. You may not have realized it, but your light has come. So <clears throat> this is Isaiah chapter 60. What we usually regard it as third Isaiah. Uh, that is chapters 56 to 66. Not everybody agrees that it's a separate composition from Second Isaiah. There's certainly some continuity, and chapters 60 to 62 seem very much like Second Isaiah, and may indeed be part of Second Isaiah. Uh, but what you notice going through these chapters is how the tone changes. Now, in chapter 60 to 62, we're still bright and enthusiastic, and more or less the way Second Isaiah began in chapter 40, that everything is now turned around and it's going to be great. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And this motif of light runs through these, through Second Isaiah, and this be a light to the nations. For the glory of the Lord is risen upon you, for darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over all of you. Now, this is wildly enthusiastic, let's say. This is you know, the reaction to being released from Babylon, returning to Jerusalem, and thinking now that the whole world order is going to be turned upside down. <clears throat> Nations shall come to your light, kings to the brightness of your presence. Your sons shall come from far away, your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. A, a multitude of camels shall cover you. Doesn't specify how or with what. <laughs> but, uh, but, the, uh, but, but the idea is, you know, that the camels will come bearing the wealth of the nation. Uh, they'll bring gold and frankincense and proclaim the praise of the Lord. Uh, what are these clouds that uh, fly and so forth? So, and uh, chapter 60 goes on in that vein. So this is still, you know, in the, the early days of the Restoration, great enthusiasm, uh, the disappointment hasn't set in yet. Chapter 61 begins with a famous passage, because it's quoted in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, as the opening sermon of Jesus in the Capernaum uh, synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. Now, I don't think there's any doubt that the speaker here is just the prophet. And the prophet is claiming to be anointed. Now, you have a few cases where prophets are anointed. Elijah was told to anoint Elisha as prophet after him, although he is never said to actually do it. And we have a couple of texts around the turn of the era that expected a prophetic messiah. We may get to talk about that later on. But here it's just the prophet talking about his own mission to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, that's the, the day of vengeance strikes a somewhat discordant note here because it's evident that the prophet doesn't intend to forgive and forget everything that's gone before here. Uh, the prophet is looking for the balance to be restored, for, for vengeance, for some kind of retribution. Uh, <clears throat> so they shall build up ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, they shall repair the ruined cities. Now, again, there that, that the speaker in chapter 61 is, recalls the figure of the servant in the earlier poems. You know, the figure 
who the bruised reed he will not crush and so forth, but who will, but is to bring uh, captives out of captivity and give light to the nations. By the time you get to 62, though, that you may get a sense that something isn't quite working out. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication. You shall be called by a new name. Uh, for you shall no more be termed forsaken. Upon your sent walls, O Jerusalem, this is verse 6, I have posted sentinels all day and all night. They shall never be silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest. Why do you have to remind the Lord? Well, and maybe because he's forgetting about it. You know, the, the point here, I think, is this prophet has been proclaiming this wonderful transformation, and now it's not happening. Now, this is a, a problem that comes up a lot later on in apocalyptic literature. The delay of the end. In the New Testament, this would be called the delay of the parousia, because the end in question is the return of Jesus. But here it's just the divine intervention that isn't coming quite as fast as they had hoped for. Uh, so you who remind the Lord, take no rest. Uh, the Lord has sworn by his right hand, by his mighty arm, I will not again give your grain to be food for your enemies, and foreigners shall not drink the wine for which you have labored. And uh, so, again, it, um, it uh, ends with an emphatic proclamation that these promises are still good, but you do need to remind the Lord that it's time to do something about it. <laughs> now, by the time you get to chapter 63, the tone has changed considerably. It starts out with a passage, who is this that comes up from Edom? Edom was to the south. Now, in the, are you familiar with the divine warrior hymns in the early part of the Hebrew Bible? Judges chapter 5 is a good one. There's one in the book of Habakkuk. And typically, it's the Lord comes from Sinai. And or comes from the district of Edom. And these are the passages that lead people to think that the worship of Yahweh originated somewhere to the south of Israel and, uh, and at some point then was brought north. Who is this that comes from Edom in garments stained crimson? Who is this so splendidly robed marching in his great might? Why are your robes red? I have trodden the wine press alone for, from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Now, the image of treading the wine press here is a metaphor for stamping on the nations. If you're treading the wine press, you're causing juice to squirt out of the grapes. <laughs> And the idea here is that he would be causing blood to squirt out of the nations. It's a fairly violent image, but it's calling on God. You know, that the, the classic divine warrior march was in the Exodus, and then Yahweh coming from Sinai. And what the prophet is saying, it's time to do that again. Now, that passage in itself would lead you to think that the problem was still with the nations. But as it goes on, it talks about how the, the Israelites rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. But then in 63 verse 15, Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation, where are your zeal and your might? the yearning of your heart and your compassion. For you are our father. 
Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer from of old. Now, that's a, a puzzling passage. What does it mean to say that Abraham doesn't know us? Uh, Paul Hansen, who taught at Harvard for all his career, uh, wrote his dissertation on this material, and he argued that this reflected a split within the Judean community, that Abraham and Israel stand for the leaders of the community. And I mean, it's hard to see in a way how they wouldn't. I mean, Abraham you know, has to be uh, uh, represented by the leaders of the community, you would think, and equally Israel. So his conclusion was that you have a dispute over the control of the temple and what is to happen in the temple, what kind of policies. And that the people behind Third Isaiah lost out. The other side of the coin is what you get in Ezekiel 40 to 48. Now, if you remember in Ezekiel 40 to 48, the mantra was no foreigners. No foreigners uncircumcised in heart and flesh were to go anywhere near the temple. In Isaiah chapter 56, on the other hand, it says, Happy the mortal who does this, the one who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, refrains from doing any evil. Do not let the foreigner join to the Lord, say, the Lord will surely separate me from my people. And do not let the eunuch say, I am a dry tree. Now, why is he talking about eunuchs? They, they couldn't serve in the temple, that's right. Uh, what kind of service demanded that people be eunuchs? Not slavery so much, but the court, the royal court. And Herodotus talks about this, yes. Uh, I switch back there to Isaiah chapter 56. So the first verses of Isaiah chapter 56. But uh, the Greek historian Herodotus says how the Persians required high officials to be eunuchs. And they probably weren't the first to do it. The reason was they would have access to the royal harem. And the, the most efficient way to avoid problems was to make them eunuchs. Uh, Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. We'll talk about him next day or next week, and uh, he was most probably a eunuch. Sometimes on reliefs, you get high officials with no beards, and they're generally thought to be eunuchs. But evidently, there were a number of Jewish people, Judeans, who had been co-opted into the royal service in some way, and who now found themselves excluded from the temple by any strict interpretation of the, of the laws. Uh, but says, um, says Third Isaiah, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name. The Hebrew expression is Yad Vashem. Uh, Yad Vashem. There is a, a memorial garden in Jerusalem called Yad Vashem. You know, it is in honor of righteous Gentiles, you know, who were helpful to Jews during the Holocaust. And the Yad here, which Yad is the word for a hand, but it's also used for a monument and a name. Now, <clears throat> the reason the eunuchs need a monument and a name is the normal way in which you lived on in the ancient world was in your children. And if you weren't going to have any children, you need something to endure after you. 
So that's what's being promised there. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted. At least in that part, it's clear that he, the prophet accepts the temple cult. The temple cult is a good thing. The question is, who should have access to it? And third Isaiah leads in the direction of open access. You know, the foreigners, so long as they keep certain laws, but foreigners are not excluded just because they're foreigners. And equally, eunuchs or other uh, people who are uh, disabled in some way or other are not to be excluded according to this point of view. Now, this is quite the opposite of what we had seen in Ezekiel 40 to 48, which said no foreigners should be allowed in there. And where you have a strict division between the sacred and the profane, and the priests are to take off their vestments when they leave the altar, lest they communicate holiness to the people. So there does seem to be some division of opinion here. And it becomes uh, more acute in the later chapters of uh, Third Isaiah. First of all, in chapter 64, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood. Now, to rend the heavens and come down, the idea is like you did on Mount Sinai, to have a theophany. Uh, for ages past, no one has heard, nor ear has perceived, and, and so forth. So it's calling for you in verse 8. You, O Lord, are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the works of your hands. And so it's calling on God to intervene, to do something about this situation. Now, this is a level of frustration that you don't get at all in 2nd Isaiah. In 2nd Isaiah, you know, prospects are good. In chapter 60 to 62, <coughs> prospects are good. Here, not so much. In chapter 65, <clears throat> I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who provoked me continually, sacrificing in gardens, offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs, spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. Now, uh, Paul Hansen, writing on this, figured the people who say I am too holy for you, that must be the priests, you know, who didn't want to communicate holiness to the people. If you read it that way, then the assumption is that everything that goes before it is just polemic. You don't necessarily assume that these people were eating pork or uh, drinking some abominable stuff. That's just polemic. It's just abuse. You get a lot of that, and especially you get it with, if you have an exclusive society where you don't know what's actually going on in there. People tend to imagine the worst and project it. Now, not everybody accepts that interpretation. Some people would say, no, there must have been some kind of syncretistic cult going on. And heaven knows that is also possible. There may have been people doing strange things. But at the same time, 
uh, when you put this together with some of the other passages in Third Isaiah, it does look like it's a polemic within the community, that it's a split. A little bit further down in verse 13, thus says the Lord God, my servants shall eat. Now, in Second Isaiah, Israel was the servant of the Lord. Here, my servants seem to be one party within the people, but not the whole people. And many people would look to these chapters as the beginnings of sectarianism. Now, sectarianism will erupt full-fledged, probably in the first century BC, maybe already in the second century, when you'll get the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes and so forth. But this is perhaps the first case where you get the idea that the servants of the Lord are not the whole people. The servants are one faction within the people. You also get the impression here that this particular faction is on the outs. Because this it says, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. To whom is this addressed? Well, on Hansen's interpretation, it would be addressed to the leaders, or the priestly people who were controlling the temple. If not that, it's hard enough to see who it's addressed to. But my servants evidently are not getting enough to eat and drink in the present. So they feel excluded. My servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. And what they're hoping for is eschatological reversal. You know, a final judgment when everything gets turned around and then you get exactly the opposite of the situation that you have now. Uh, for in verse 17, I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. Now, uh, where else does that phrase come up? Where else does God promise the new heavens and the new earth? Any of you ever read the New Testament? <laughs> <laughs> Louder. Revelation, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, in the book of Revelation. No, and for that reason, th this, these passages are sometimes called proto-apocalyptic. Uh, you know, they have some of the elements and motifs that you will get again in apocalyptic literature. They don't have them all. It's not, this isn't really apocalyptic literature as we will meet it in the book of Daniel, for example. And the difference is this. I'm about to create new heavens and a new earth. Be glad and rejoice for in what I am creating. Uh, I will create rejoice in Jerusalem. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. Now, when you get to the book of Revelation, or when you get to the book of Daniel and the Old Testament, the hope is for a situation when you actually live forever. Now, maybe not in your body, <laughs> but in a resurrected body, or some spiritual afterlife. But that's the main difference between this material and what you will find later on. And I think, you know, that is actually one of the great shifts in that, that affected and shaped Western culture. The, the belief in the afterlife, when it arises, changes everything. You know, if you really believed in an afterlife, that means, you know, this world would not have that much attraction. You would not be hoping to see your children and your children's children. You'd be hoping to get out of here, to be raptured, whatever. Uh, 
Now, you're not there yet here. What is similar, though, to the later apocalyptic literature is the idea that you need a clean break and you need to start over. The situation cannot be ameliorated. It isn't just a matter of making a few improvements here and there. You need to go back and start from scratch. A new heaven and a new earth. But the new earth that they're imagining here is essentially like the present, but better. So you live longer. But eventually, you die. Everybody has their own house and fig tree and so forth. But still, you know, it's, it's an earthly fulfillment that you get here. And wrapping that up, it says, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. This is quoting Isaiah 11, you know, the vision of a messianic age where even the wild animals are tame. So that's the kind of vision you get here in Third Isaiah. But there is one other passage here, maybe two, in chapter 66, that requires further comment. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What is this temple that you build for me? Now, you know, as we saw last day, building the temple was a big deal. It did not come easy. It took them 20 years to get started, however long it took them after that. And it took considerable sacrifice on the part of the community to do it. And now on comes this prophet and says, who needs a temple? What is this temple that you build for me? Now, the beginning of this, so heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. You get that already in 1 Kings chapter 8 at the dedication of Solomon's temple. And in the dedication of Solomon's temple, the, the point is, you know, God lives in heaven. He doesn't really need a temple. And then the answer is, but the temple is provided, you know, as a convenience, as a concession to human beings so that if they want to pray or offer a sacrifice, they have some place to go. Here, though, the, this is, uh, what is this temple that you built for me? All these things my hands have made, all these things are mine with the implication that God doesn't really need a temple at all. Now, as we've seen a fair bit in the prophets of preaching against cult, against sacrifices, and the usual assumption there is that they weren't really rejecting everything, but they were objecting to the way things were actually being done. And I would assume that that is also the case here that the objection is to the way this temple is being set up. But you can see this is, is poles apart from the, the attitude, say, of Haggai and Zechariah, where for Haggai, if you don't build that temple, you'll never have a good harvest again. You'll just have drought. And this prophet says, fooey on that. Uh, this is the one to whom I will look, the humble and contrite in spirit who trembles at my word. The word in Hebrew is hared. The people who tremble are haredim. Have you ever heard of haredim? Go into Brooklyn any day. You'll see plenty of them dressed in Lithuanian dress, you know, with, uh, with hats and furs in the middle of summer. Uh, the the ultra-Orthodox. I mean, in modern times, the ultra-Orthodox are referred to sometimes as Haredi. And so, it's, you know, it's the, the extreme, if you like. Now, I'm not saying that the people here are ultra-Orthodox in that way, but this is where the idea comes from. 
that the, the people who really please God are not the people who build, bring bulls and rams to sacrifice them, but those who tremble at the word of God. Now, whoever slaughters an ox is like one who kills a human being. Now, the Hebrew doesn't actually say that. What the Hebrew says is, uh, slaughtering an ox, killing a man. And uh, again, sacrificing a lamb, breaking a dog's neck. So there are two ways you could read it. You could read it as it's read here in the NRSV and say that sacrificing an ox is like killing a man and sacrificing a lamb like breaking a dog's neck. I mean, this would be blasphemous to anybody you know, who practiced the regular cult. The other way of taking it is saying that the same people who sacrifice an ox one day may go out and kill a man another day. Uh, but it's kind of implausible, I think, that people who were sacrificing a lamb for Passover, say, would also, on occasion, sacrifice a dog. Unless, again, you're just engaging here in polemic. So I think the more plausible way of reading it is to say that this person is disparaging sacrifice and saying that it's no better. You know, killing an animal is like killing a human being. Now, one of the, the arguments against that is that back in chapter 56, we saw that it was saying that foreigners are welcome to bring their sacrifices. So at least this prophet didn't start out being opposed to the temple cult. And I'm assuming then that if this is what this passage means, uh, this is born of disillusionment, born of frustration with the way the cult actually developed. But this is a pretty sharp exchange of uh, a, a, a exchange of views here. Yes. Maybe. Fifty-six and sixty-six. You know, uh, I mean that's certainly possible. I don't recall anybody arguing it because. You know, as you go through the chapters, especially starting in 60 and going through to 66, you know, the mood changes. It becomes more and more frustrated, more and more calling on God to rend the heavens and come down, calling for a new creation. So I think it's more plausible that you have the same author or group of authors, maybe, and that their view changes uh, over time as they go along. At the end of chapter 66, <clears throat> um, as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. That's speaking now to the servants. And then in verse 24, they shall go out and look at the dead bodies of the people who have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. This sometimes gets quoted as a biblical proof text for hell. It is what, the, the, what it is referring to, I think, is Gehenna, which is sometimes used as a, as a metaphor for hell, but Gehenna is Gehinnom, the valley of Hinnom, outside Jerusalem, where they burnt the garbage. <laughs> now, what you're imagining here isn't quite hell. We'll get to hell eventually by the end of this course. But, but, <laughs> but the difference is, it's not suggested here that, that their enemies will be alive to feel the worms. <laughs> you know, I think they'll just be burnt. No, it's vengeful. 
There is no doubt about that. It's, uh, it's promising these people who feel now that they're being mistreated. The day will come when you will be able to go out and look at their bodies just burning. As I say, we haven't quite got the sophistication yet uh, to realize that it would be more satisfying if they were alive and being burned. Which is a bit the classic Christian doctrine, later on. But, uh, but here, though, at the same time, it's a lasting punishment. In some of these texts, you might say they're flirting with the idea of a final judgment. They're not there yet. But they are looking for some kind of total victory and total humiliation of, the, of, those, of their enemies. Any reactions to any of that? Yes. Yes. Now, I don't think it's necessarily saying that you must uh, obey all the laws in Deuteronomy. But it's, it's what you typically get in the prophets. What does the Lord require? You know, that one walk humbly with your God and do kindness, chesed, you know, behave decently to your fellow human beings. But you see, in, in everything we've seen so far, there are two poles in religious observance. And I would submit to you that we still have them very much today. Now, they're not mutually exclusive, but people put the emphasis on one end of the spectrum or on the other. And one end of the spectrum is holiness, ritual, performing sacrifices, whatever. And the other is humane behavior, justice, this kind of thing. Now, as I say, they're not mutually exclusive. You can, in principle, have both. But in practice, people tend to put the emphasis on one end of the spectrum or the other. And you have biblical warrants for both of them. For the holiness end, you have Ezekiel. For the... the Justice and mercy, and if you like, uh, what I say here would be a case in point. Now, there's one other section of the book of Isaiah that I will just comment on briefly here. It's Isaiah 24 to 27, often called the Apocalypse of Isaiah, although it isn't an apocalypse. An apocalypse is a revelation. And the way the word is used later on, it's an, uh, a revelation that has to be explained to you by an angel or a supernatural being. <coughs> That's what an apocalypse is. What you have in Isaiah 24 to 27 is just oracles. But these oracles are about at least a metaphorical end of the world. The Lord is about to lay waste the earth and make it desolate. He will twist its surface, scatter its inhabitants. This is at the beginning of chapter 24. The earth dries up and withers. The earth languishes and withers. The heavens languish together with the earth. The earth is polluted. You know, if you ever want to preach a sermon on the environment, it's a good text. Now, of course, what the prophet meant by the earth is polluted isn't what we now mean by it, although it's polluted in both cases. <laughs> in this case, it would be polluted by, by human actions, presumably. Uh, so, and on, at the begin, end of chapter 24, on that day the Lord will punish the host of heaven and heaven and the kings of the earth and the earth, and they will be gathered together in a pit, and the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion. So, 
you know, it's, the whole world will be destroyed, except Mount Zion. So Mount Zion kind of rises out of the ashes, supposedly. But what I emphasize here, and I'll come back to this on Friday, is that in the later prophetic writings, you get this um, imagining of a final and total judgment. It's not enough to defeat the Assyrians or the Babylonians. You have to gather all the nations. In the book of Joel, you gather all the nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat and zap them all. You know, you're looking for, as I say, a totalizing solution. Now, in Isaiah 25, you get, I think, a rather nice expression of that. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all the peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow of well-aged wines strained clear. I like that. You know, th this is... What do you want in heaven, <laughs> in the hereafter? <laughs> well, in this passage, good meals, good food, which they probably didn't have, you see. <clears throat> he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all the peoples, the sheet that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. Again, if you ever have to preach at a funeral, it's a good text. Uh, now, it's an allusion to a Canaanite myth. Back, if you remember, you probably heard this at the beginning of the first semester, the story of Baal and Mot. And in the Canaanite myth, it's death swallows Baal until Baal's sister comes to his rescue and so forth. But what's being promised here is the day will come when Yahweh will swallow death. This does not mean that the dead will then rise, but it means there won't be any more death. And death, I think, is used here to sum up everything that's wrong with life. You know, it's the ultimate summation of it. And it's put very much in terms of the old Canaanite creation myth in swallowing up death forever, the world gets reestablished and done right, or restored to its proper order. There is a passage in chapter 26 that many people take as a reference to actual resurrection, although I don't. It's in, um, in chapter 26, in verse 14, it says, The dead do not live, shades do not rise, because you have punished and destroyed them. But then, a few verses further down in verse 19, Your dead shall live, their corpses shall arise. O dwellers in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a radiant dew, and the earth will give birth to those long dead. Now, I take that in the same spirit as Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones. And that what he's talking about is Judah or Israel coming back to life after the exile or after being humiliated by the nations. But I would say scholarly opinion is about 50-50 on it. About half the scholars who write on this take it as actually referring to the resurrection of individuals. I think all of these chapters, I say 24 to 27, were probably written around the 5th century BC, probably at the time of the destruction of Babylon by the Persians, not the first conquest, but in the uh, uh, a later one. Um, and I think it would be a couple of hundred years after this before you get belief in individual resurrection. But you can see they're kind of tending that way. And then at the beginning of chapter 27, another verse that kind of sums it all up. On that day, the Lord with his cruel and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, 
the twisting serpent, and he will kill the dragon that is in the sea. What's the dragon that is in the sea? Loch Ness. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> but, but you see, back in the, again, back in the old Eucharistic myth, it's uh, Yam is the sea. And in the Eucharistic myth, this monster is sometimes called Lotan, which is probably the same word as it has evolved that comes out here as Leviathan. In other passages in the book of Job and in the Psalms, this sea monster is called Rahab. But it's a common ancient Near Eastern idea that the way the world got created was that the good God conquered a monster that is in the sea, Tiamat, in the old Babylonian myth. And it's an, an imaginative way of expressing, you know, an ultimate conflict between good and evil. And it's not just moral evil. I think Leviathan and the, the chaos monster, you know, represents all sorts of things that are wrong. So natural storms, you name it, viruses. All of that would be, be included in, in Leviathan. And the, the dream here is, you know, for God to put an end once and for all to everything that is wrong with the world. Now we'll see that theme picked up again in the book of Daniel. It's developed a lot in literature that wasn't included in the Hebrew Bible, but that has come to light in the last few centuries. And it would be quite fundamental to Christianity. But some of that is a little down the road. On Friday, we will have a lecture instead of sections this week. And I will we'll read the book of Jonah, which I think is a nice kind of meta-commentary on prophecy. And then reflect a little bit on the prophetic literature as a whole.